Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Kisilenko, a service uh, chief at Silver Hill Hospital. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today for uh, virtual ground rounds on um, interventional psychiatry, focus on brain stimulation. In a moment, I will introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Ostroff. Uh, but first I have a few uh, housekeeping items. We would love to hear from, uh, uh, from you, from all the audience. At the end of the lecture, we will have some time for questions and I welcome your comments as well. Uh, to submit a question, please do so at any time during the presentation using a Q&A link at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, for those wishing to receive a CME or CEC credits, um, please complete the evaluation survey that will automatically pop up uh, in the browser at the webinar's end. Again, the evaluation survey will automatically appear at, uh, at the end of the webinar in the browser. Uh, also, of course, um, uh, we will uh, email a copy of the survey so you can find it in your email and fill it later. And uh, lastly, some uh, disclosures. Uh, no planners of this activity have any relevant financial relationships to, dis uh, to disclose in relationship to the presentation. Um, it is uh, now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ostroff. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of cooperating with him on numerous patients, uh, but now I uh, uh, become aware for the first time of his uh, biography, of his prodigious uh, work. He is currently a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Yale University. He is a medical director of the Mood Disorders Unit uh, at the Yale University School of Medicine and at the Yale Psychiatric Hospital. He is also a co-director of the Interventional Psychiatry at the Yale Psychiatric Hospital. Um, he received his medical degree from George Washington University School of Medicine. And um, he was elected to the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Society. Uh, he specializes in um, ECT, in uh, ketamine infusion studies, in transcranial magnetic stimulation, in medication management. Um, the list of his publications is quite long. There are more than 50 different scientific publications on a number of topics. Um, and um, something interesting, he's also published over 200 uh, articles popularizing uh, topics uh, uh, in um, uh, psychiatry, including uh, uh, ECT, uh, TMS, ketamine treatment, uh, and others. Um, so um, he has been uh, helpful both for the scientific and the general community with, uh, with his educational work. Uh, now, uh, without uh, further ado, I give the word uh, to uh, 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 Dr. Ostroff. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. That's very kind. I appreciate the introduction and it's a pleasure to honor to be here today. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what interventional psychiatry is as a budding subspecialty in psychiatry. I'll talk a little bit about our service and how it developed, uh, but focus primarily on ECT and transcranial magnetic stimulation today and we'll be happy to take questions at the end of the uh, lecture and overview. Our service at Yale is made up of five attending psychiatrists, a nurse practitioner, a chief resident. We're adding a fellow and another attending in July. So it's been a growing service over the last, I, I would date it 25 years because it started with ECT initially and we added ketamine in 2013 and TMS in 2015. So disclosures, I'm involved in the uh, uh, patient-centered income out, uh, patient-centered outcome research institute, which is giving us a grant to compare ketamine to ECT in a multi-centered trial and as ketamine clinical trials from Janssen and don't intend to talk about any off-label use of medications or treatment today. So to start with, as everybody knows, the brain is a complex neurochemical network. Uh, there are multiple nodes that communicate with each other. Within each node, there are literally millions, if 
not billions of, of synapses, that the, these nodes convey information to other parts of the brain. That's a relatively new discovery. We thought the brain was primarily communicating within the body, but different sections of the brain communicate with each other through these nodes. And they're propagated uh, uh, along the neuron and then release uh, neurotransmitters at the synapse. What we often forget is all the stuff that's going on here at the synapse is intended to produce an electrical stimulation that runs to the next nerve cell and aids communication. So the brain is both a uh, chemical and an, and an electro electronic uh, organism and made up of networks of both. And I think we've spent the, the last 50 years in psychiatry looking at what goes on here in the synapse and not paying that much attention to the, uh, the electrical part of it. And that's been changing rapidly in the last decade. So we think of interventional psychiatry as a rapidly emerging area of us psychiatry. It had its beginnings, obviously, with Hippocrates. Everything started with him in modern medicine. He noted that malaria-induced seizures using electrical eels during the, uh, I'm sorry, that malaria-induced seizures in patients and improved their mood. And then later on, electrical eels were used to, in, to treat melancholia and inducing seizures through the electricity generated from the eels really started 75 years ago with electroconvulsive therapy that opened up what we're now calling modern interventional psychiatry. And in the last decade, we've seen the development of both invasive and non-invasive neurostimulation techniques, and also rapidly acting pharmacologic interventions utilizing novel delivery mechanisms, primarily IV, but also intranasal. So we now have brexanolone for postpartum depression, which is a 60 hour inter intravenous infusion and obviously as ketamine or spravato, which is an intranasal infusion. And I think that's the tip of the iceberg of what we're gonna see over the next decade. So if we define it, uh, Williams initially talked about it being a subspecialty of general psychiatry that utilizes neurotechnologies, primarily neurostimulation. We expanded that to say that interventional psychiatry is something that requires expertise in pharmacotherapy and particularly expertise in new means of delivering pharmacologic treatments. Using our service as a model, we go from the least invasive interventions to the most invasive interventions, starting with uh, uh, transcranial uh, current stimulation, also known as TDCS, which has been, has had wide use in Europe, is not approved for use in the United States yet, but it's probably coming. It's it's very inexpensive and, and not invasive, but the data so far has been intriguing, but not convincing for its use, particularly in the treatment of depression and ADD. Repetitive uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is probably the least invasive approved treatment that we have. Uh, it's now approved, different, different mechanisms are approved now in the United States for major depressive disorder and for OCD, also used for PTSD and for uh, nicotine craving in Europe that may or may not be coming here. We have to see about how the data unfolds. The, the next most invasive treatment is probably the gold standard for treating MDD and some other psychiatric disorders that we can get into is electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, carries its own special burden in terms of the prejudices about it. Uh, vagal nerve stimulation, is an intriguing treatment and involves implanting a, uh, a stimu stimulator into the chest wall and running a wire up into the neck around a branch of the, of the vagus nerve. And the idea is that it stimulates the central nervous system. It's been approved in the United States for the treatment of both refractory epilepsy and for depression. It grew out of the epilepsy data 
the problem has been it's a very invasive treatment and the data is controversial because there's no to date uh, placebo controlled trial with the vagal nerve stimulation. So CMS chose not to cover it about eight years ago, which makes it very hard to get payment for. And there's now a large multi-centered study going on in collaboration. It's unique because it's in collaboration with CMS and NIMH to fund a study for the vagal nerve stimulation to see whether it meets their criteria for use in refractory depression. Deep brain stimulation is to date an experimental method. It involves implanting electrodes directly into different areas of the brain and providing intermittent but controlled stimulation, not inducing a seizure. Uh, it can be upregulated or downregulated. There, there's not a lot of data yet, and the problem has been locating the appropriate area to stimulate in the brain as a more directed kind of intervention. And right now it's experimental. I don't know if it'll ever reach the level of approval in the US. Uh, it's also been used to treat Parkinson's most successfully, uh, mostly because the target or organ, the target area in the central nervous system, the basal ganglia are more clearly identified as the pathophysiologic location of Parkinson's disease. Ketamine, everybody's heard about. We started using it uh, in research protocols 20 years ago. We started using it clinically uh, roughly nine years ago and moved initially using it as an IV infusion. We're involved in the clinical trials for Spravato S ketamine and are now using S ketamine and IV ketamine uh, for the treatment of treatment resistant depression. Uh, these are, are, we're now doing trials with neurosteroids, both IV and orally, psilocybin and Botox as possible treatments. Uh, and I think what we're going to see over the next 10 years is an explosion of uh, interventions, both elect electrical and chemical, and probably a combination where we're using uh, surgical techniques to deliver uh, to deliver pharmac pharmacologic agents directly to the area of the brain that we want to target. But I think we're a decade away from actually seeing that come into clinical practice. So our, our interventional psychiatry service is essentially a consultation and a clinical intervention service. We start with with doing complex evaluations of patients. We see both inpatients and outpatients. I, I think it's worth drawing attention to the fact that the majority of patients who receive any of these treatments at Yale are outpatients. They're not hospitalized patients. So it's really primarily an ambulatory service uh, for about 85% of our clientele are coming from home. We do medical clearance of the patients, which is essentially looking to see if there's any medical explanation of their symptoms. We do psychomotor, psychometric testing on everybody, looking at mood and cognition scales. Also, uh, we use subscales of the BPRS for psychosis. And we use these both in research, but we do the same scales in the clinical setting. So we follow the patients using these scales and we use them to make decisions, which I think is a very important loop. If you're gonna use evidence-based interventions, you have to gather the data, but also use the data, data in a clinical setting to make decisions. So we have checkpoints where we use these scales to make decisions about treatment. Then you can uh, break down what happens to the patients in two directions. One is neuromodulation, where we're currently using uh, repetitive TMS for major depression, and we're also using ECT for major depression and bipolar depression, and for a subgroup of patients with schizophreniform disorders. Pharmaceuticals, primarily we're using ketamine and S-ketamine. There are clinical trials going on. Right now, the 
the most active trial, the two most active trials are using psilocybin as a potential treatment for treatment resistant depression, uh, but also what people forget about is the value of concomitant cognitive behavioral therapy. And we have several trials going on linking uh, S-ketamine to cognitive behavioral therapy to see if we can improve the endurance of the clinical response. This is our this is our major treatment setting. We also have an annex with uh, three more infusion beds. This is a six bed PACU. You can see the six beds spread out. It operates Monday, Wednesday, and Friday as a, as an ECT service, and Tuesday and and Thursday as a ketamine as ketamine service. We've recently opened this annex so we can do ketamine on days other than Tuesday and Thursday. We were originally locked into only being able to do uh, ketamine or S-ketamine treatments on non-ECT days, but we have the capacity to have some overflow into the other days of the week. And TMS is a five-day-a-week treatment, and I'll get more into that later on. So we're operating that uh, Monday through Friday. And we have a separate treatment area for TMS. We have a monthly journal club with a clinical case conference. We're now doing our own grand rounds uh, every other month with an outside speaker. And we also have our business meeting uh, connect at following that meeting. Uh, our key personnel now are we have five attending physicians, a chief resident or a fellow. We're adding a fellow in July. Uh, we have four full-time ECT nurses and, are, uh, and several uh, per diem nurses, and we have two mental health technicians, and again, adding a third per diem mental health technician. These are the individuals who do the uh, rating scales and also serve as TMS technicians. So what are the fundamental principles of a successful interventional service. One is that we had to work hard to define the service with clear standards of care. Uh, often we were in the position of writing our own standards, but we had had a number of workshops where we worked on providing written standards for how the physicians, the nurses, and the technicians practice. We have to supply adequate training for the staff. So we're delivering complex medical treatments and challenging patients. There's not a standardized training pipeline for any of these treatments. So we had to develop our own and do our, our own ongoing medical education for both the nursing staff and physician staff. Uh, developing a financial model, I'm not gonna get into, but it's important to develop one that supports the service and coverage has always been an issue for these treatments. We also actively try to manage the perception of the service so we can enhance patient access and comfort. We worked very hard to have it be a mostly ambulatory service where people are coming in from home and the pandemic actually posed special problems to this, but we were made, we've been able to stay open through all of the COVID days, but not without a lot of, of special preparation and changes in the way we do business. Uh, You know, if one was going to go about setting up a successful service, practice standards uh, for medical and ancillary staff are obviously necessary. Clear criteria for each intervention, and I'll get into that more later on, is very important. Uh, one of the things that we've done that we regard as fairly unique is we have all of these services, all of these treatments as part of one service, where typically what you see is centers that will do one of these treatments such as ECT or ketamine or TMS, but not integrate them under one roof. Uh, and it's caused a lot of extra work to do that uh, because people tend to advocate whatever intervention they like best and to try and work out an, our own algorithm has been uh, a very interesting process. We have standards for quality of each procedure. So we have quality measures built in and we do a uniform assessment suite for each patient, like I mentioned above, that whether we're doing clinical research or just clinical care, we're trying to gather the, the same 
set of data and information for each person who receives a treatment from us. And then again, I, I can't emphasize this too much. It's not enough to just have a way of, of rating how the patient's doing, but you have to actually use that and see if the outcomes can change and you can intervene depending on the rating scales or the data that you're gathering. So I'm gonna move on to talk about, I'm gonna use MDD or treatment resistant depression as a model. Uh, for uh, full disclosure, I don't like the term treatment resistant depression. I prefer to use the term difficult to treat uh, disorders. And if you look at our gold standard of data for real life treatment of depression, the STAR-D study, you can see that the remission rates are very low. Patients who get citalopram as first line therapy were leaving 60 plus patients who were not responding. Anything you do in the second line, whether you go from citalopram to escitalopram or citalopram to bupropion or anything else, it didn't do much better. So we still have a fairly large group of people who have not remitted after we get past two. When we get down to three, we're getting, we're picking up only 13% of those patients left. And we get down to four, it drops even lower. Uh, one of the things I think that we're unfortunately satisfied with is a partial response. And I think it's more important to look at remission rate. There are very few people with cancers who are happy that you got them half better or third better. Uh, and I think it's more important to look at remission data than just response data. Our psychiatric illnesses are, are severe and they're life altering. If you look at issues with quality of life, this is, this is the 10 leading diseases uh, contributing to global years lived with disability. And on, this is on the average, how long do you live with a disability from your condition? And you can look at mental and behavioral disorders, lead the league, they're at 22.7%. Neurological conditions, you can add another five and a half, and this is where dementia is put. And you can see how other conditions are, are significantly less impairing than psychiatric disorders, and yet we tend not to think of these disorders at, at, with the same value or the same intrusion on quality of life as other disorders. This is uh, the incidence and mortality. Uh, this is an age-adjusted age incidence for women with breast cancer. And you can see uh, how, it's, how the mortality has not, not changed all that much over the last 40 years. But in uh, the last ad on this slide is for 2013. So your chances of dying of breast cancer are about uh, 13 per 100,000. If you look at the adjusted suicide rates in the United States, again, over a 17 year period, we're looking at a comparable rate of suicide per 100,000. So essentially the, your chances of dying of breast cancer in the United States are the same as your chances of dying from suicide. And we just have only recently started to take this seriously and look at it uh, as a serious uh, health problem, not just a mental health problem. So this is one view of modern pharmacotherapy that we're kind of walking around in the dark. This is the actual six blind men, not five blind men, as one of my residents pointed out. But a lot of times how we use an agent really depends on who's using it and what we're using it for. And it's often just a choice of the pharmaceutical company, what they intend to classify it at and go at after for an indication to see how it's ultimately used. I mean, a good example of this uh, is the SSRIs, which people think of as antidepressants, but they're very effective anxiolytics as well. I'm not sure we do that much better with uh, neurostimulation right now, particularly if you look at the deep brain stimulation literature. Uh, 
and that we're just kind of poking around in the central nervous system trying to decide what does what. But there's been a real explosion of research and data about the central nervous system over the last 20 years, and particularly ways of intervening in the last 10. But I think it's important to understand that we're really manipulating the synapse with our drugs in ways we don't entirely understand, and we're manipulating the chemistry of the brain in ways we don't entirely understand. And I think it's important to be humble about that as we approach treating these patients. So as I mentioned before, we do a, a complex clinical evaluation, including neuropsych testing, appropriate rating scales, laboratory analysis, and, and interview patients. We then uh, make a uh, decision as to whether to move on to electroconvulsive therapy, ketamine infusion therapy, ketamine nasal spray, or RTMS. Uh, I, We'll say that about 20 to 25% of the patients that are referred for one of these interventions, we find that what they really need is a different pharmacologic intervention. And if we make pharmacologic changes, they can avoid any of these treatments. We do have a tumor board model and we intentionally call it the tumor board to highlight how sick the individuals are and how life-threatening their disorders are. Uh, when we evaluate them and we meet once a month uh, in a multidisciplinary format. We invite neurology, psychiatry, and anesthesia to have input into these cases. And we have an ongoing confidentially, confidential multidisciplinary forum and we present uh, complex cases. And in order to be credentialed at Yelna Haven, you have to attend at least half these meetings and present uh, cases at them. But it, it provides us a way of, of looking and discussing patient treatment who are often needing interventions that are beyond clear empirical evidence. And it's worth having a discussion and input from different disciplines, uh, including different psychiatrists when that happens. So let me, let me move on to, be, to talk about electroconvulsive therapy. It's really the most effective treatment in psychiatry today. It's also the most burdened. Uh, the, uh, this illustration was used in a magazine article where I was interviewed to talk about ECT and they were going to prevent, present a non-biased view of electroconvulsive therapy and they chose to illustrate it with this picture. This is Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and I often tell people that there are two kinds of psychiatrists. If you do a word association test to uh, ECT, there are those who admit the first thing they think of is one flew over the cuckoo's nest and there are those who lie. Uh, it's really had a pervasive effect on this treatment that I don't think we're going to escape even though the stigma tends to be much less now than it used to be. ECT is the gold standard for treatment-resistant depression. These are patients who have failed two or more antidepressant treatments. The response rates are 60 to 80%. The remission rates are 50 to 70%. Response here means that they've had at least a 50% reduction in symptoms. Remission means that they're basically symptom-free at the end of the treatment. It should not be the treatment of last resort. It's often viewed that way because of the stigma or the burden. If there's poor functioning work relationships, we recommend discussion of ECT after the first or second failed antidepressant trial. Uh, we take the mortality rate from poorly treated depression seriously. And again, it compares to the mortality rate of breast cancer. So, uh, it's a real risk in these patients who are seriously ill and don't have relief of, their, of the burden of the disease. Uh, cognitive side effects still exist, but there's uh, less than previous modalities of ECT. The way we do ECT now is not the same as the way it was done 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. And uh, when people talk about ECT and they're thinking of the way that we did it in the 50s, 
I try to remind them that we used to operate with the operating room windows open for ventilation. Sorry, I forgot I highlighted this. I always feel like I need a young person to help me with the slides. What diagnoses, what conditions are we using to, uh, in, are we using ECT to intervene for? Uh, obviously, the number one is major depressive disorder, severe with or without psychotic symptoms. Uh, if, if they have psychotic symptoms or significant suicide risk, we would intervene early. The treatment resistant depression, failure of at least two medication trials for an adequate time and an adequate dose uh, are, is often used as the standard now for what TRD is. And both the European Medical Administration and the FDA are using that standard now. Uh, remission rates 60 to 80% among TRD patients, which I think is very important to remember. It's also a very effective treatment for bipolar disorder uh, and bipolar depression. It actually is effective for mania. We rarely use it to treat mania. And one of the things that we don't talk about a lot is that our pharmacologic interventions actually are much better for mania than they are for depression. And we rarely see a patient with refractory mania, but often see patients with uh, difficult to treat depression. It's useful for treatment refractory psychosis and schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. It's not approved now for this use by the FDA, but there's a study going on trying to get that approval. Uh, it is a, it is a, catatonia is approved for uh, uh, ECT treatment and it's, and it responds exquisitely well to ECT if Ativan lorazepam fails. And it's irrespective of the precipitating cause. For those of you who are familiar with catatonia, the cause can be medical or it can be a psychiatric condition. More commonly, it's a psychiatric condition, but we see, we've seen it develop with a number of medical conditions, including uh, NMDA uh, encephalitis, uh, which we've seen to uh, merge into catatonia and not respond to chemotherapeutic interventions, but respond to ECT. We always think trying Ativan first is important and we're only using ECT on the patients who fought, who've failed an Ativan or lorazepam challenge. There is uh, very good data about the treatment of Parkinson's disease with or without comorbid mood disorder. It tends to, uh, it relieves the bradykinesia. There have been studies that show that it's not just patients with Parkinson's and depression who have a relief in their motor symptoms. It's underutilized in this population, probably because of the stigma about ECT. At any given time, we've had patients with both Parkinson's disease and depression who are getting monthly ECT treatments in our uh, outpatient setting and are on no medication for either, but just a monthly ECT treatment. Uh, treatment refractory epilepsy status epilepticus has been shown to respond to ECT. Again, usually the drugs that we have for this are so good, it's rarely, uh, it's, it's a rare occasion that ECT is necessary for an intervention here. So demographically, who's the appropriate ECT patient? There's no age cutoff. Adolescent through geriatric patients are appropriate for the treatment. There's been a, a lot of studies and data in uh, populations across the whole spectrum. Uh, much less data in children, but there is good data in adolescents and clearly in adults and in geriatrics. There are no absolute contraindications to ECT. We, we've never seen a patient that we wouldn't treat because of their medical condition if they thought they needed it. I, I can't highlight this too much. You have to make accommodations when there are uh, co relative contraindications, but there's never been a case where we thought we wouldn't do ECT when it was necessary because of some medical contraindication. We do worry about uh, 
increased intracranial pressure. I can get uh, into that a little bit more later. Uh, but I wouldn't rule out the treatment. We had one gentleman who was in a catatonic state and had a cardiac arrest following ECT in another setting. And they refused to treat him uh, and wanted to put a peg tube in and send him to hospice. The brother got him transferred to us. We optimized his medical condition and successfully uh, were able to tr treat him and restore him to his baseline using ECT. Uh, I thought it was an interesting choice that they would avoid taking the risk of treating him but send him to hospice to die. Uh, it's safe during pregnancy. Again, we try not to do anything during pregnancy except support women emotionally and whatever medical needs that, whatever medical conditions they need to have treated. We have seen a number of pregnant women who uh, it was safer to treat them with ECT than pregnancy. And it's, there are a number of, of reports about its use during pregnancy that highlight its safety. Relative risk factors are cardiac conditions, arrhythmias, uh, uh, coronary vascular disease, neurological disorders. We worry about uh, space occupying lesions. We worry about CVAs. We worry about aneurysms. Uh, there, nobody's going to do a controlled study using ECT to treat people with aneurysms or, or cerebral vascular malformations. We've been able to collect cases and have reported on right now about 12 patients who've had these conditions that we treated successfully. Uh, but again, it's a relative risk and you have to weigh the risk versus the benefit. Uh, implanted intracranial devices depend on the size, location, material of the objects. If they're metal objects, we try to avoid them in our lead placement. Uh, but again, I've been able to successfully treat people with a variety of uh, implanted devices. When we've had to treat somebody with vagal nerve stimulator or deep brain stimulation, we turn off the device before the treatment and turn it back on after the treatment because of the concern that, that it may reset the device if it's left on during the actual treatment itself. And again, there's no data to support that happens, but it's with an abundance of caution, we turn it off. ECT is used for psychosis. When CMS reviewed this and, and recently, they thought there wasn't enough data for the indication and wanted another study done. The, the data now supports that there is a reduction in symptoms, positive greater than negative. Most effective augmentation for neuroleptics. If you look at the data for clozapine and using ECT that's been well delineated, there's about an additional 40% reduction in schizophreniform symptoms when you add ECT to clozapine. There's a reduction in aggression, suicide, self-harm, hospital readmission rates in relapse. Side effects are well tolerated. One, one of the issues is, is how long to do ECT in these patients who have had the 40% reduction, and there's not good data that helps inform that. Uh, we do have a handful of patients who've continued multi, uh, monthly treatments because they've done so well, and then we review it every six to 12 months. So what, is, what does ECT look like in our center? The patient presents for the first treatment, checks in with a psychiatrist, the interim progress is reviewed. Uh, if it's the first treatment, we go over it with them carefully before they come and go over it with them again the night before. We check the NPO status, review outpatient medications. Uh, we hook them up to a, uh, an EKG and monitor their vital signs, start an IV. If there's any uh, pre-procedure medications that might be necessary, we administer them prior to the treatment, usually that's going to be antihypertensives and antiemetics. Uh, sometimes we use pain medication in patients who've had headaches after the treatment. Uh, in the uh, treatment bay, they're received by the anesthesiologist who goes over the treatment with them again. EEG leads and ECT electrodes are placed. Uh, there's an induction with the bag mass ventilation. 
And I would highlight this is one of the things we've stopped doing during the pandemic is we don't do pre uh, oxygenation and hyperoxygenation because of the risk of aerosol in the age of COVID. Uh, no routine intubation. We do intubate um, women who are past their 18th week of pregnancy because of the concern of uh, an aspiration. And in special cases where we're worried about aspiration, we will intubate, but that's very rare. It's less than one in 100 treatments. There's an induction of general anesthesia and then a neuromuscular blockade. And then that's followed at maximum neuromuscular blockade. It's followed by a stimulus delivery. Generalized tonic-clonic seizure, we try not to let it go past 120 seconds. Uh, there is emergence and reorientation that usually takes five to 10 minutes. We will use a, we used to use a bag mask for uh, respiratory support. We're not ventilating the patient. We're giving them uh, high doses of uh, O2 oxygen, either through a mask or through nasal cannula, but we're trying hard not to uh, uh, give them respiratory support unless we have to, which occasionally happens because of the degree of paralysis, but often yeah, it's unnecessary. If after the patients received in the nursing recovery area, there are two things that can, there, or there are three things that can happen. The vast majority of the patients slowly wake up. Some have woken up before we've even gotten them out of the treatment area to the recovery area. We see a fair amount of emergence delirium or post-ictal delirium because the patients both are emerging from, they're both, they're emerging both from anesthesia and they're emerging from having a grand mal seizure, so there can be some agitation. When that happens, we give them an agent, usually a short-acting benzodiazepine to help them sleep for another five or 10 minutes so they can sleep through that period. Uh, when, they're, when they're ready for discharge, we review the uh, recommendations with them and we do post-procedural vitals. Fairly straightforward treatment in and of itself. Uh, there's a uh, pre-ECT workup, consent of the patient. At the index series, when they come for treatment number one, we determine the seizure threshold at the time of first treatment. This differs widely from patient to patient. Some treatment centers don't do this determination. They do an estimation based on uh, the age of the patient and the sex of the patient. We don't think that's accurate enough. Uh, we think the data supports uh, slowly titrating the electrical energy until we induce a seizure at treatment number one, and we mark that as the seizure threshold. And then treatment number two, and then going forward, we use that data for the seizure threshold to set the stimulus and depending on the, whether the kind of lead that's placed, we will go up either one and a half to two times over the threshold or five to six times over the threshold. We try to treat to response uh, and then go to remission if we can. Sometimes it's hard to get patients past uh, uh, a response to treatment into remission, but our goal is always remission. Uh, the continuation of ECT is after the patient has had the maximum response, we make a decision about whether they should go on medication prophylactically or have a tapering dose of ECT over the next six months. We pick that six month uh, period because uh, it's the time of highest relapse. If, you, if a patient has responded to fluoxetine or sertraline, and they, re and they remit and you immediately stop the medication, their relapse rate over the next six months is about 55%. If you immediately stop ECT after they've remitted, their relapse rate is about 55%. So the choice is either to use an appropriate prophylactic treatment or to continue ECT. The choice to continue ECT is usually based on the individual's patient history that they've tolerated the treatment well, they failed multiple agents prior to ECT. And in that case, we would recommend continuing it for six months. 
usually they come back a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later. We get out to the uh, four week period and we'll do monthly treatments for three months and then stop at the end of that period. If we're not gonna stop at the end of that period, again, we reassess it and determine whether to stop or not. The vast majority of our patients, we stop there. Some patients have had multiple relapses, multiple courses of ECT, uh, multiple medication trials. They're doing quite well. We will extend that past the six months with monthly treatments. And again, we will review that. And then that's what we call maintenance ECT. And we'll review that every six months. We won't uh, do that indefinitely without a periodic review. We require the patients come in and meet with us separately and discuss whether to continue. Uh, over the last year, I've had several patients want to continue because of where they are in their lives. There have uh, been two graduate students who didn't want to jeopardize their studies and they were doing so well, they opted to continue monthly ECT for a year so they could get through school and then make a decision about whether to stop. And again, it's based on individual patient characteristics. Uh, so I think that was a duplicate side. So the, the major barrier to care is uh, the stigma has been dying. I used to think that was the biggest barrier to care. Right now it has to do with provider access and there are not many people who are well-trained and do ECT uh, in a program that can duplicate uh, uh, similar treatments. We have a lot of trouble with our patients in our area who are snowbirds and they're going to usually to Florida or Arizona. And we've had to collect providers in those places who might continue some form of continuation or maintenance treatment when the patient leaves the area. Uh, Patient cannot drive uh, at all during an acute series and they can't drive on the treatment days during continuation or the maintenance phase of treatment. This has been a major barrier to care for us because the patients are receiving general anesthesia so they can't take Uber home. They have to go home with a responsible adult. For the patients who don't have that situation, we've worked hard to find an agency who will provide transportation with a responsible adult who will actually take the patient into their, sorry, into their house or into their uh, apartment and not just drop them off at the corner. And that meets anesthesia standards for transportation. So we've had patients uh, uh, we had a young man take a train from Brooklyn for his treatment in the morning, but he was accompanied by a relative who went with him both ways. So it gets to be complicated, but it's doable. Uh, we have not had any insurance problems covering ECT. Sometimes there's a copay. It's usually fairly minor. Most of our patients start treatment as an outpatient and continue as an outpatient. Uh, a, a much smaller group of our patients require hospitalization, mostly for safety issues, uh, sometimes actually for transportation issues and monitoring issues, uh, but most are, are home. Most of our patients continue to work while receiving ECT. It's actually been easier during the pandemic because a lot of people are working virtually. Uh, typically we advise people when they come for an acute series to plan on not working uh, for the first two or three weeks while they're getting treated. Uh, but many of our patients can work on off days and a smaller group can actually work on days they get treated. Uh, so the whole point of ECT is to deliver an electrical stimulus great enough to induce an adequate seizure while minimizing the risk of significant side effects. We do this by uh, carefully deciding what placements we want to use for the electrodes. The right unilateral placement is the one that seems to have the least cognitive side effects, and it's probably the one we use most commonly. Uh, we monitor the EEG during the uh, treatment. This is uh, the last generation of devices we use. There's a new device that just came on the market six months ago that we've started to use that doesn't change the fundamental treatment very much, but has better monitoring built in. Uh, 
typical ECT related side effects, myalgias after the first two treatments, it's mostly due to the dose of succinylcholine, which is the uh, uh, muscular relaxant agent. So this is what's paralyzing the patient. What happens when it wears off? There's microscopic contractions of the muscles and patients will complain of going to the gym for the first time in two months, uh, that it's that kind of pain. I've never had to treat it with more than a couple of aspirin or Tylenol. It's always worse after treatment number one or number two. And number two, it goes away usually pretty quickly. There can be masseter tenderness because of where the electrodes are placed. There's a superficial stimulation of the masseter muscle in the jaw and a contraction. Again, it's always worse with treatment number one and two. Mild headache. Uh, when patients complain of a headache, we give them usually Toradol as a uh, pre-treatment the next time they come in to try and prevent the headache from developing. Most common side effects are sh that people are worried about in terms of cognitive side effects are short-term memory deficits. We're inducing a generalized grand mal seizure, so it's very common to have uh, an hour of memory loss before the treatment, an hour of memory loss after the treatment. People are very aware of that, so they will complain about that, but that's actually something that happens about 20% of the time. There's decreased reaction speed. Much less common are what we call autobiographical memory loss, and this is retrograde amnesia, That, and it tends to be extremely spotty, so somebody will say they went to their cousin's wedding three months ago and they don't remember the after wedding party. Uh, the short term memory usually comes up that they don't have a, a, a clear memory of the conversation they had with their significant other in the car coming to their appointment in the morning and they've forgotten that. So they worry about their memory. So we try to reassure patients about memory loss. If you uh, listen to Kitty Dukakis, who's become a big advocate of ECT. She says this should be viewed like nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy. It shouldn't stop you from getting the treatment. So I'm going to move on to TMS for another 10 minutes or so and then open it up to questions. Uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation is the use of an electrical coil with current and it induces a magnetic field. The magnetic field depolarizes the underlying neurons. And the idea is, is they're downstream effects of this depolarization. So the magnetic pulses uh, for the treatment of depression stimulate the dorsal lateral, lateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, it's, uh, we're talking about this area right here. Uh, I'll show you how it's how it's determined in a minute. There are high frequency pulses that activate neurons, and there are low frequency pulses that inhibit inhibit neurons. So there are there's a strategy being developed that we can use the high frequency pulses to activate neurons in the left prefrontal cortex where they seem to be depressed, and low frequency to inhibit the neurons in the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex where they may be activated. And so this has been a developing, evolving treatment. What we know from, from all the data with different nodes in the brain is the superficial structures are connected to deeper brain circuits. In this case, they may be related to mood changes, uh, in particular changes in the, in the limbic system, and it leads to changes in neurotransmitters it also changes long-term potentiation pathways and receptor concentration. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides. Sorry about that. Uh, so if you look at functional neuroimaging studies, it suggests a role of cortical gover governance over limbic activity. And so the idea is if you can stimulate the uh, left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, you actually can activate the limbic system through these nodal connections in the brain. 
and that's the aim of of TMS. It's really the it's one step closer to what's and what people regard as the holy grail of neurostimulation, which is to be able to give focal non-invasive, non-convulsive stimulation to treat depression. In this case, it's the prefrontal cortex. So one of the ways of, of measuring where the prefrontal cortex is without using functional fMRI, which few of us can uh, afford, is to determine where the prefrontal motor strip is. Uh, find the area on the left side. And what we're trying to do is find where we can stimulate and have a thumb twitch. And it usually takes about 30 to 60 minutes of repeated stimulations until the idea is the thumb should twitch uh, five out of 10 stimulation trials. Then you've identified this area. So you're identifying the area that causes the uh, thumb twitching on in the uh, right hand. This is the old humunculus drawing. And then you go five centimeters in front of it. And that's thought to be the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. These devices tend to have a fairly wide area of stimulation. So you can be slightly off and still stimulate this. There are. Uh, localizing devices that are now on the market to help you with this measurement so you can get it in the same place each time. Some people place a, a what we do is use a removable cloth cap that goes tightly over the patient's head and when and do these measurements and then we can mark it here and then put the cap on each time and have it stimulate in, the, in roughly the same place each time. The first treatment day uh, with the determination of motor threshold takes about an hour and a half. And then over time, there's a slow escalation up to 120% of motor threshold. Uh, one thing about TMS is that it's a, a time consuming treatment to administer. It's five days a week for roughly six weeks for most patients to have a clinical response some people recommend stopping after 20 if there's no response by that time. Uh, often patients go to 30, have a, re have a response or remission, and then it's, uh, they come back once or twice a week for another three or four weeks and then stop. Uh, right now, the, the treatment in the United States is confined to uh, major depressive disorder or OCD. The indication is for MDD and one device on the market, BrainSway, which tends to have a different, has a different coil and a different penetration, has been approved for OCD. Uh, contraindications where there's no clear data is bipolar uh, depression, depression with psychotic features, the existence of a seizure disorder, uh, the existence of a serious head injury or traumatic brain injury. Uh, implanted medical devices or metal in the head is a concern because of heating up those devices and serious substance abuse, which also is a relative contraindication for ECT. We would not treat somebody who's actively using substances. Currently off-label uses, PTSD it is widely used in Europe, but not in the United States, but there's studies going on for PTSD, migraine, there were studies at Yale done for auditory hallucinations, uh, for treatment resistant auditory hallucinations that were done by a, a former colleague of mine, pain syndromes and post-stroke rehabilitation. Uh, and the idea is that uh, increasing the energy in the central nervous system leads to more neural uh, plasticity and may, may help with the post-stroke recovery and with the pain syndromes. Uh, there are no clear biomarkers of response. Uh, we don't have subtypes of symptom clusters yet that show clear response. Uh, there, the treatment so far has been patients who were less sick, failed fewer medication trials, uh, 
and also had the augmentation of antidepressants. Uh, it may be most co cost effective after one failed trial. The unfortunate thing about this is the insurance coverage for TMS tends to force it to be used for treatment resistant depression, which is the population where it's probably got the least effect. The, uh, so they're looking at, at typically three or four failed medication trials, often including medication, failed psychotherapy, ECT was recommended, and the cost is comparable to ECT. So I think the unfortunate thing is some of the financial data is driving the use of this treatment in the population that's uh, least likely to benefit from it. So the question is, how often do people respond? The response rates are 30 to 40%. Remember, the ECT response rates are 60 to 80%. Remission rates, 15 to 30%. Uh, the best multicentered study, the remission rate was 23%, and the average antidepressant trial was 1.6 antidepressants. So again, it's not truly a treatment-resistant uh, depression treatment. Uh, behavioral activation with CBT strategies, augment response. This is something we've been very excited about. We're doing this with ketamine now and plan to do it with TMS. So there may be a role for uh, uh, concomitant psychotherapy and TMS, uh, medication augmentation, uh, and maybe medication washout. Uh, and I, I will say that the trials with OCD used a form of behavioral activation where the patients were asked to think about the, their most bothersome symptoms, the contamination fears they have, uh, et cetera. And the same thing has been going on now with PTSD. And the idea is the treatment, uh, the efficacy of the treatment may depend on what the patient's thinking when they receive the treatment. Uh, common side effects, headache, neck pain, pain or irritation at the stimulation site. Headache is quite common because if you've ever seen TMS or heard it, there's a tap, 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 tap on the head and patients will complain of pain there. There have been reports of induction of mania or hypomania. This may be due to the concomitant medication they were on. There is definite uh, risk of hearing loss, so our patients all wear earplugs during the treatment because it's a loud noise they're, they're exposed to over and over again. Uh, there's been fainting reported. Seizures are actually extremely rare, and I, if the motor threshold is calculated uh, carefully and the placement is careful, it's it's uh, extremely rare, but all sites have a, who do TMS should have a seizure protocol in case it does occur. Uh, I'm going to run out of time and need to stop in a few minutes, so I'm going to skip through some of these. 36 treatments is the average. Uh, motor threshold, which I talked about, is at the time of the first treatment, but there's also a determination of that because there may be changes over the time. So it's often done at treatment number 15, it's redetermined. There's no good data for maintenance treatment, unlike ECT or ketamine. Uh, an initial response, positive predictor for future response. So there are patients who've had TMS five years ago, responded, they've had a relapse uh, that would predict a, a second response. We need, uh, to accept a re, uh, what remission means and have a standard uh, definition of remission rate. And this really has to be driven by some kind of rating scale, either the MADRIS or the uh, HAMD, depending on the center. But there ought to be a standard definition. If you look at the studies, ECT remission rate is around 75 to 85%. Ketamine remission rate is 40 to 50%. And TMS remission rate, this is for TRD now, not for MDD, uh, is 23%. So, so you can see how they stack up against each other in terms of efficacy. Uh, I think the algorithm should be patient driven. And the choice is important that if patients want to try 
one of the treatments first, we should at least listen to that and make a decision based on that. Um, coming in the future, so we now have uh, OCD with the BrainSway device, uh, low frequency RTMS to stimulate the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is something that's being tried. Faster protocols are, they're, they're not coming, they're here and most machines have a device uh, have an attachment to their previous device that will give theta burst, which is a much more rapid uh, treatment. So it takes the treatment down from 40 minutes to as low as five minutes. So it may be much more uh, efficient. There's no data that it's more effective. Most of the data looks like uh, it's going to be as effective as traditional R RTMS. Uh, alternative stimulus param stimulation parameters are being developed. Neuronavigation is really based on, uh, on mechanical location of where you're stimulating the patient each time. I'm not sure it has the value uh, that it needs considering the cost of these devices that produce neuronavigation. Uh, and we need to look at augmentation or combination strategies. And we tend to be most excited now about the use of, of CBT with these treatments. So where are we going? I, I think we need an algorithm who gets what, when, and then what. Uh, we don't have that. It, it will be a long time before it's empirically driven and had to have studies. We don't have a good study going now that has that's the equivalent of the STAR-D for devices uh, or these extreme interventions. I think we need a nationally coordinated service. That's why we're big on, on interventional psychiatry. I'm impressed by my patients on dialysis who want to go out to watch an Ohio State football game with their grandchild on Saturday morning. The dialysis unit in New Haven calls out there and arranges for them to get dialysis. And typically when we have a patient who wants to go down to uh, Palm Beach for a month and get one treatment there while they're away so they don't risk relapse, it's very difficult to arrange that. And we've been struggling to arrange that kind of homogeneity between sites. Uh, we need better subtyping of patients based on neurophysiologic subtypes and a more rational approach to financing. And I think what we're gonna see is new IV inhalation and intranasal agents coming in the future. This is, this is my group just to acknowledge uh, the wonderful colleagues and collaborative work that I'm able to take part in at Yale. And I'm supposed to signal when I'm done, but thank you for listening. And this is the end now, and hopefully we can move on to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ostro, very much for uh, uh, this presentation. It was uh, quite informative. And uh, now I can um, uh, present uh, the multiple questions that uh, we have recorded. Uh, I wanted to ask something we, uh, to pick up exactly where you finished, to ask you a little bit about the, the algorithm. Um, uh, when, when we are presented with a patient, a lot of us wonder, okay, the we've run out of medications, let's say, or how do we choose which, which of these interventional treatments fits which patient? Who will do well with ketamine? Who will do well with TMS? Who will do well with ECT? There are some guidelines, uh, people with uh, psychotic symptoms or with, uh, uh, with melancholic depression probably will do better with ECT, but what's your personal alg algorithm after all these decades of work? Oh, it's a great question. I think we need an algorithm. I've been uh, trying to work out one that makes sense. I mean, the, the, both the interesting and the frustrating thing is there's such a wide variety of histories and clinical experience with the patients, it's hard to have one algorithm. If you went by efficacy alone, uh, everybody should get ECT. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, we know that people with major depression and psychotic features have about a 93% remission rate with ECT, as opposed to MDD alone have about a 70% rate. Uh, so that would make me think of ECT. We're reluctant to give ketamine to people with psychotic features and certainly reluctant to give TMS because there's no data. 
Uh, so I, I would tend to stratify it based on the individual patient's characteristics and individual risk. I think if there are a, remember that ECT is given under general anesthesia. If there are a serious anesthesia risk, maybe TMS makes more sense to try first. Uh, I do believe in patient choice. We have one of the things that has been, I don't think it's uh, something that I have to keep confidential, but we've been doing a study of ECT versus ketamine and the patients have to be referred for ECT first and they're offered the chance to be randomized into one group or the other. And we were afraid that everybody would want to go into the ketamine trial first. And we found just the opposite, that people were referred for ECT and that's what they wanted. And they didn't want to be in the trial because they didn't want to waste time on getting what they regarded as an experimental treatment. So it's been interesting to see patient choices now and how that's changed over time as the stigma has changed. Uh, the reason I'm not answering your question is I don't think there's a clear answer about an algorithm. I think you have to approach it systematically and use common sense. Uh, and my personal feeling is common sense is based on experience plus thinking about that experience critically. So I would make the decision that way. Uh, we've had patients who are terrified of the idea of ECT who go through TMS and ketamine and then get better with uh, with ECT. Ultimately, we've had people fail ECT who then got better with ketamine. Uh, I mean, I, every every modality has a story like that, so it doesn't help us very much. I think what we have to do is better characterize the patients based on uh, better biomarkers. We currently don't have any. Uh, so I, I think it's really highly individualized right now. I do think, I, I can tell you though, in terms of approaching patients, I think that you have to start by reviewing their history and what's been tried to date. I, there, there are so many patients we see who, I mean, it was interesting to me, recently I read the European uh, Medication Administration's discussion about treatment resistant depression and they talk about two or more antidepressants. And they go into this discussion about how it's, there's no data, but maybe, maybe a trial of citalopram followed by escitalopram isn't the same as a trial of citalopram followed by bupropion. So you, know, you have to use common sense. I mean, if I saw an individual who had Selexin and Lexapro, I don't think I'd tell them they need ECT. I think I might want to try another antidepressant, either, even though technically they're in that TRD category. So I think it's more an approach now than a clear algorithm. Thank, thank you for your answer. There are a few questions connected with um, uh, expanding the indications for, uh, for ECT. There is a question, why not use ET, ECT for uh, serious substance and alcohol problems? The medications don't work and um, would ECT help with alcoholism? You know, I don't think so. I think, I think there's no data for that. I think only to the extent that uh, sometimes alcoholism is driven by a uh, partially or, or poorly treated affective disorder and that ECT might effectively treat the uh, affective disorder and diminish the desire to drink. But I, I think those kind of comorbidities are really uh, problematic. I mean, I always go back to AA. They always say there's always a good reason to drink. Every alcoholic will tell you that they're drinking because they're depressed, not that they're depressed because they're drinking. And it's so hard to tease that out. I would not, I would not, I just don't think there's any empirical data or any rationale for treating substance abuse disorder unless you can identify a clear comorbid uh, mood disorder. Where I've seen that the most is OCD. We know that in, in clearly defined OCD, ECT does not work. But we also know that the most common cause of treatment resistant OCD is comorbid depression. So we will treat somebody with OCD who has a clear comorbid depression, hoping that both will get better. But I wouldn't use it to treat OCD alone. Thank you again. Um, there is uh, another question. In a recent multi-center uh, study, uh, ECT was uh, uh, including uh, 
uh, McLean, uh, Emory, uh, Mayo Clinic, um, ECT was used to treat agitation, not responding to pharmacological interventions in dementia, in Alzheimer's dementia. Do you think that's a, a promising future indication? No, it's a, it's a good question. I, I actually wrote an algorithm for the use of ECT in dementia. Uh, I, I think that we see people with dementia who've had a previous history of MDD that has responded to ECT, obviously, and they present with social withdrawal and en energia, sadness, loss of appetite, that's a population that I think would benefit from ECT and it becomes a quality of life issue. Uh, if I thought there, again, if I thought there was a comorbid condition that I was treating and a demented patient that might respond to ECT, I think you have to weigh the risk benefits. Would I use it only to treat agitation without understanding the comorbidity? I'd be very careful about doing that. I'd, I'd, I'd want to define more clearly what I was treating. Uh, thank you. There are a few questions connected with potential uh, 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 side effects. One of them is uh, how often does ECT induce mania in bipolar patients? Actually, it's been pretty rare, but I think it's because we don't take people off their medication. Uh, we do see it. Uh, we see people become hypomanic. Uh, my experience with it, it's, it's probably one or 2% of our bipolar patients will have a manic episode. We're always wanting to watch that carefully. So when we've done two treatments and the patient comes in and says they feel wonderful, uh, we start worrying about that. But the typical treatment for that is to keep treating them uh, because it, it is a good mood stabilizer and it does treat hypomania that's induced in, that, in the setting of ECT. So we probably wouldn't not treat somebody who got acutely manic, we'd probably continue to treat them because mania responds to ECT as well. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Another question involves uh, the, uh, the effect of ECT on patients who have had a significant trauma with propensity to dissociate. How does ECT affect people with uh, dissociative uh, symptoms? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. I, I don't know of any data that helps with that. I, I always worry about people with dissociative symptoms that, that any kind of uh, intervention may make that worse. So it's something we'd watch carefully. I can tell you it's something we're much more concerned about with ketamine because ketamine causes dissociative, at least transient dissociative states in patients. So we're very careful about those patients when we uh, use ketamine, we're, we're less concerned about it becoming worse with ECT. So uh, the, some of the questions are swerving a little bit of the, the ECT and TMS. Uh, one of them is uh, which of the two applications of ketamine seems more, more effective, intranasal versus IV infusion? <coughs> I probably can answer that in six months. We're looking at all our data and comparing it now. Nobody's done a head-to-head -head study and there probably never will be a head-to-head -head study. Uh, we have a fairly large database of ketamine patients, of people who were treated with racemic ketamine infusion as opposed to S-ketamine. And fortunately we get the same ratings in those patients. So we're in the process of pulling out all of that data from our electronic medical record and trying to compare the two groups and hopefully we'll have some way of answering that. Right now, I can't honestly say, I, I can tell you that uh, we were fortunate to have pretty good insurance coverage for ketamine infusions. So we're able to treat a fair number of patients. And when S-ketamine came available, there was a larger group who we could treat. And some people who went from the ketamine infusion to the nasal spray felt like it wasn't the same and didn't help them as much and wanted to go back to the infusion. What's hard to, to know in that case is just you know, if you increase the intrusiveness of an intervention, you're going to incre increase the expectation and the belief that it's going to be effective. So how much of that was based on belief and what people like to call placebo response is hard to know. Uh, 
I, I'm hoping we'll have some meaningful data sometime over the next six months about that. Thank you. And uh, there is uh, another question uh, about something that you mentioned uh, early in the, in the lecture. Um, what is uh, your opinion about uh, the transcranial direct current devices? So some of them are uh, like alpha steam are, are sort of vying for FDA approval. I didn't know that alpha stem was applying. I, I mean, I think alpha stem and some of these TDS, TDCS devices uh, have uh, are promising. I think they're probably going to be promising more as augmentation agents. Uh, they do increase the resting potential of the cells when you use them. And I think we're still learning about them. They're widely used in Europe and they're widely used in the US by gamers. People can you can go on YouTube and figure out how to make your own with uh, four AAA batteries. They're pretty easy to construct. Alpha Stim, I think, is probably a cutaneous uh, vagal nerve stimulator. And I think that's going to have some value in the future. There are proof of concept devices that are, that are uh, percutaneous uh, devices around the ear trying to stimulate branches of the vagal nerve and have the same kind of effect that you see in vagal nerve stimulation. So I think this is promising technology. I just, I don't think we know how to use it yet. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Ostrov. Thank you for uh, this uh, 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 really very informative presentation and interesting. Uh, thank you to all the attendees for joining us. I want to remind again um, who, uh, for CME and CEC credits, uh, the evaluation survey will, survey will uh, automatically pop up uh, in the browser when the uh, webinar ends. Um, uh, thank you. This will conclude our grand rounds. Thank you and goodbye.